go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Scott Bales. I'm an architect at Cunningham Group uh, for the past uh, probably year and a half since the first, uh, first few weeks of 2020. Uh, we've been working on a uh, inpatient behavioral health facility that we've dubbed a comprehensive psychiatric care center. Um, and I will be presenting the planning and program, introduction to the planning and programming of this facility. Um, my co-presenter, co uh, Sammy Mansour, will uh, present herself. Uh, your audio is cutting out. Is it better now? Yes. I'm Samuel Mansour. I'm a designer at Cunningham, and I've also been working on um, the same project with Scott since 2020. Um, so, yeah. So, our learning objectives uh, we were qualified for one CE HSW credit. Um, go ahead and email uh, MJ. She put her email in the chat um, and she'll get you that credit. Um, so, today we're going to be looking at what a behavioral health facility is under OSHPOD 5. Um, we're going to touch on the history of uh, healthcare facilities, do some code analysis, uh, talk about concerns and uh, different building typologies and the things that make up the look of a behavioral health facility. Uh, uh, and one of the items we're introducing is So first, we just want to briefly introduce the history of behavioral health facilities and how we kind of got to where we're at today. So behavioral health facilities have been around for thousands of years, not always known under this term, but kind of known as lunatic bins or psychiatric wards um, or even prisons in a lot of areas. And basically, the goal of those um, facilities was to completely isolate mentally ill people from society as they were seen as dangerous and um, unrecoverable. In America, it wasn't until the mid 1800s when there started to become more advocacy for the mentally ill and their living conditions. Two of those advocates were Dorothea Dix and Dr. Thomas Kirkbride. Kirkbride had his own facility and he implemented the Kirkbride plan, which was pretty monumental for its time. It gave a lot of natural light, maximum ventilation and views to outdoor as, outdoors, as well as separating patient population based off of sex, age, and also um, the severity of the mental illness to ensure that everyone was getting the quality of care that they needed. And although there were these ideas of moral treatment being um, thrown around and implemented in a few facilities, funding really um, did not allow this to take off nationally. And it really wasn't until the 1950s when there started being a national push for deinstitutionalization and outpatient treatment. And then following that came the Community Mental Health Centers Act of 1963, which helped move people back um, with mental illnesses back into the community. And this was crucial because it really created, um, for lack of better terms, a halfway house, where it was this place that was in between a clinical and non-clinical setting, where it had some of the clinical attributes that you would find in a psychiatric hospital, but also had a lot of qualities that you would find at home to better integrate and slowly integrate um, people who were part of those facilities back into the community. And then in the 1980s, evidence-based design became more popularized, and those research studies have really helped to understand design elements that have a positive impact in these facilities, and then that leads us to modern day with code and um, guidelines. Yeah, next slide. So the, the question is, what, uh, what is an EPS and, and why do we need it? Emergency psychiatric services. Um, as part of the continuum of care, we have these, uh, um, these connections that branch off in all different directions. For mental health care, we're talking about a patient that is in crisis or nearing crisis, or maybe exhibiting um, a, a mental health um, issue uh, before they know it, or they may not even know they have one. Um, so what our hope is with the emergency psychiatric facility is to address the components that we can 
while eliminating the need for the higher cost um, services. So in this case, we're, we're diverting people from the emergency department. Um, instead of having someone in crisis go to the ED, they may be better treated at a uh, psychiatric facility or uh, mental health urgent care. Um, we're also designing these facilities with those people in mind. Um, we wanna be able to see multiple demographics come in. Um, and that's the comprehensive part where we're able to treat adults and minors, adolescents, um, all age ranges in one facility. Um, and that leads to an age appropriate design. We wanna make sure that the child's unit looks like a child's unit and the adult unit looks like an adult unit. Um, and then in that same vein, we wanna make sure that they stay separated. We don't want them interacting um, we then move down to uh, these, these facilities are designed with uh, human-centered design. Um, we have, uh, we want to consider the patient's dignity, uh, the freedom of choice. Um, these are designed as healing environments for people who are in need of mental health support. Uh, some of the driving um, typologies or some of the environmental impacts are ligature-free, barrier-free, uh, safe environments. And those are going to have a very specific look uh, in the facility and it will be noticeable from other facilities that don't have uh, those safeguards. Uh, and then we're looking for a care facility that is designed for specialized care. Uh, we know when it comes to mental health that one size does not fit all and we want to be able to assess the specific needs of the patient. Uh, I'm not gonna read this whole thing. Uh, I added it to the slide just for a brief history of where Oshpod 5 came from. Uh, before Oshpod 5 was brought in, before 1228 became code, we were picking and choosing for healthcare facilities. We would take a little bit from an emergency department and we'd take a little bit from a prison um, code. Uh, and it was really just a gap that was missing. So Oshpod 5 introduced code and chapter 1228 uh, which allows for the code and, and specific design of these facilities. So we know how to program them, how to plan them um, around uh, a, a specific code reference. Uh, additionally, we, we refer to Title IX for rehabilitative and developmental services, uh, Title 22, um, and then of course, uh, OSHPOD 5 and the CBC. Um, some of the highlights, these are the, the spaces that have the greatest impact. Um, they're, these are the ones that are outside of 1224. You'll find after going through um, quite a few of these that there's quite a bit of reference back to 1224. Um, some of the exceptions are the six foot hallways and corridors as opposed to the eight foot hallways and corridors. Uh, again, I would, I would hesitate to go with the minimum in a, in a mental health care facility. Uh, we, we still have the potential for gurneys um, and stretchers to be going down these hallways. Uh, the people going down these hallways and corridors may not always want to be going down these hallways and corridors, so we have to consider uh, two or more people side by side um, helping them get down the corridor. Um, and then the support areas, we, we do want to create as many support areas for the staff so that they don't feel confined, confined to the patient areas. And we do that through conference, conference rooms um, for treatment planning, staff respite areas, uh, lactation rooms um, with, a, with an onstage, offstage approach. Um, moving through the list, uh, some of the more unique rooms are the quiet room. Uh, and these spaces have minimum square foot, square footage that we have to accommodate and seclusion rooms. Um, seclusion rooms come in two forms. You can have a seclusion room with no restraint, and then you can have a seclusion restraint room. Uh, the seclusion restraint room requires additional square footage for a bed uh, to be placed for the patient to be strapped in. Um, and more, more code, uh, we have to provide dietic services, nourishment room, dining. Uh, food is important to the uh, mental health and well-being of these patients. It's a, it's a comfort um, and we have to provide it. Uh, through pediatric and adolescent, um, again, we're designing for, for uh, age-appropriate spaces. Um, 
in the pediatric, you can have up to four patients in one bedroom. Uh, during the design and planning of the facility that we've been working on, uh, it was decided that we would do less shared spaces. So ante rooms are no longer shared and uh, there's a reduction in shared bedrooms. Um, however, that being said, there is uh, quite a bit of evidence-based design that says a shared patient bedroom is uh, a safer environment for the patient. Um, so then what makes this facility a, a, an OSHPOT facility and what do we have to address? This is a very short list of what those items are. Um, being an OSHPOT building, being an I-2, uh, we get the um, designation, uh, which in, in one aspect means that we cannot exit through a non-OSHPOT, through a non-I-2 building. So all exiting goes through an I-2 space. Um, this allows us to have locked doors, delayed egress, some of the things that, that make it a secure lockdown facility uh, keeps the patients from eloping. Um, some of the cans and pins that are a nice highlight and that have been um, uh, driving some of the design. We have can 2-407, which describes a nurse station, 2-407, uh, direct access from habitable rooms. Um, and on uh, one of the more challenging ones to get from a facility, and if you've done it before, is pin eight is a list of all the hazardous materials that may be stored in the housekeeping rooms. And then moving on to the other OSHPOD components, when designing the facility, you know, you, you have the option of having separate buildings on a site, or you can have one building. Um, for our consideration, we did one OSHPOD five building, uh, but again, you can combine that with an OSHPOD one, an OSHPOD five, OSHPOD three, and there will be cost savings depending on which um, option you go with. This is something that you have to go through with the, the client, the users, um, and, and really, really drill down what's important to them and how they want to use the space to be able to make these decisions. So the main design consideration when um, designing for behavioral health is safety for anybody interacting with the space, whether that be patients, staff, or visitors. And to provide safety, separate circulation is something that is a best practice. Um, for visitors, it's important that when they're going to wherever they need to go, that they're not gonna be interacting with any violent patients. For staff, it's important to have a secure corridor to retreat if any violence were to break out. And for patients, it's important that the separate circulation always has constant monitoring from staff and um, there's minimal exit slash entry points. And this overall decreases the risk of elopement. Patients have all day to think of ways to escape and the ways that they can come up with are really creative and for sometimes like we can't think of it. <laughs> um, so one of those ways is stacking furniture to get into the ceiling um, or even standing on shoulders to jump over the fence. But overall, having that separate circulation where staff always knows where the patients are going to be and um, have a monitoring of the exit points, um, they can better decrease the risk of elopement. And when starting off, you have to determine the high, moderate, and low risk areas in the building. The low risk areas are going to be areas where patients are just not allowed. Um, moderate areas are going to be patient um, areas where patients are either highly supervised or supervised most of the time. That would be lounges and activity rooms, corridors, interview rooms. And then the high risk areas will be areas where either patients are under con extreme conditions, such as seclusion rooms, or even just areas where patients are going to be spending a large amount of time unsupervised, such as their patient rooms and toilets. And in the high risk areas and moderate risk areas, it's really important to make sure that everything is tamper and ligature resistant because if patients are ever being left alone in a space, um, it's really important to make sure that there is no point of risk or way that they can harm themselves. And when they are a harm to themselves or to others, there's two rooms um, that Scott briefly touched on in the, when he was talking about the code, the seclusion room and the quiet room. Seclusion room is for patients that are going to be having um, a pretty extreme episode and need to be restrained or held um, down. 
And this is gonna be a room that they're not gonna be in for a large amount of time. Um, it's a pretty short period room, but just a place to restrain them and calm them down. A quiet room is an area where um, it's more of a calming, welcoming room. Um, it has sometimes sensory elements, some warm materials, um, and just a place where patients can isolate themselves when and if needed. And making sure that everything is durable. There is a lot of damage to these facilities, um, breaking of windows, furniture, walls, equipment. So making sure that everything that you are putting in that facility can withstand the test of time. And for anyone being put in this position, um, it would be hard. You're getting um, a lot of your freedoms taken away from you and that's not easy for anyone to go through. So making sure that when you're designing, you're designing for distinct activity places, whether that be noisy or quiet activity or, quiet, or activity with a lot of interactive or non-interactive activity. This has been proven to allow for allow for choice, excuse me, and promote individuality and also has a, lot, um, a really positive effect when the patients leave the facility. It's less of a um, culture shock when they get back into society and um, they feel like individuals still. And of course, with the pandemic, there are some more considerations that we have to take into account now, such as rapid assessment, screening, occupancy sensors, and airborne infection isolation rooms, which we'll get more into in a later slide. So all of those considerations create a pretty distinct building. Um, one of the main things is that there's gonna be high visibility. Typically there's gonna be a central nurse, sta nurse station and always unobstructed views. Um, that um, involves not even putting a column in the middle of an activity area where patients can hide behind or even just corners um, where patients can put themselves in and limited access um, for entry and exit points and making sure that those entry and exit points are secure. Um, Sally port is something that is heavily utilized when going into the unit, making sure that there's two locked doors that patients have to go through before getting in, and that will always be an area where they're supervised. And overall, making it a healing environment and non-institutional, warm and welcoming. Um, the two pictures to the right, um, of the day room area show how you can still implement a lot of anti-ligature um, fixtures, furniture, and still make it a warm and inviting place that you would wanna spend time in. Um, and making a welcoming environment makes, is part of it is making sure that people don't feel like they could ever get lost in it. People feel most comfortable in areas that they know. So making sure that there's no dead ends and making sure that these patients can wander around freely. This is especially important for geriatric and or memory loss patients to just be able to wander freely and always get back to the same point that they started and never feel uncomfortable. And of course, anti-ligature and tamper-resistant everything. We listed out a few things, but the list goes on and on. You can see an example to the right from the New York State Patient Safety Standards Guideline. And that's just a few examples of anti-ligature windows, coat hangers, light fixtures, um, plumbing fixtures, and just making sure that anything in that building is anti-ligature and tamper resistant. And of course, providing a lot of nat natural light. There's so much design and research around how natural light really does um, help the recovery process for just about any illness and especially mental illness. And having an access to outdoors and not just um, one activity to do outdoors, but multiple activities that patients can partake in, whether that just be a quiet courtyard or activity spaces. To the right, you can see in the CHOCS pediatric unit, a very age appropriate courtyard design that has a lot of little elements for children to play around in, but also has some open green space if patients ever do need to just relax, walk around. Um, yeah, next slide. So the, the components or departments that make up uh, an APS, uh, <clears throat> from, from the outset, we wanna make sure that there's uh, as few entry exit points to the building. So you can see in our highlighted, whoops, don't hit that. you can see in our yellow highlights, we have a police ambulance drop-off that is uh, facilitated, facilitated through uh, vehicle sally port. Uh, it's just a pickup drop-off at the back of the building. And then at the front of the building, we have a 
walk-in patient uh, security secure entry vestibule. Um, from there, we break down the facility into the uh, main lobby, uh, which you can access the uh, mental health urgent care. Um, from there, you can either get to the Emergency Psychiatric Services um, Center, and this is for people with uh, less than a 24-hour hold. It's people being evaluated, um, but that, that can't be walking around outside that need to be um, secured and, and taken care of. And from there, you have the inpatient unit. Um, from the public entry, if you're bringing somebody in that needs to be addressed at uh, mental health urgent care, uh, this is where they'll be interviewed. Uh, they may need an injection on their drugs. Um, from there, if they need to be ad uh, admitted, they would go through the EPS intake process, which we'll talk about next. Um, and then from that EPS intake process, where it says adult and minor, uh, this is where everyone goes through in order to be admitted into the care facility. Um, we have all the typical uh, parts and pieces of a building. We'll have the uh, entry, uh, we'll have the covered pickup drop off. Um, and again, the, the, the idea is that these all flow together and that each point along the way has a secure checkpoint. Um, getting into the EPS intake uh, at the top of the screen on the right. Um, we want to look at these spaces with uh, flexible de design and standardization of clinical units. Again, addressing the requirements of um, an intake process. So if we have somebody being dropped off by ambulance or under a 5150, um, they would come in, um, perhaps they need to be washed or they need a shower. Uh, they have the opportunity to do that before they get into the facility. Um, once inside, they would either go to triage or go to exam. Uh, if they're coming in with large items, they may need to store that stuff outside the facility. You can imagine um, a, a trash bag or a shopping cart, um, those kind of items. Uh, and then moving through, you know, if, if they come in with one pair of clothes, they may need to have some laundry services. And these are all things that allow them to make a transition into the facility uh, with dignity, with care, um, and again, it's, 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 a, it's a psychiatric facility that the patients may be in crisis. So we have high visibility um, from our uh, nurse station or registration. Um, and then as, as they're processing, they may not be ready to go into the uh, care unit. So they may need uh, a space to uh, cool off. Um, and again, if we have somebody coming from urgent care who's not ready to go through this process, uh, we have this handoff room. It's a, it's a space for evaluation, for additional interview. Uh, again, just to prepare the patient for, for what's coming next. Um, you can see by both of these diagrams, we've separated adult from minor um, in, in such a way that they don't have to cross their paths. Um, that's important in these scenarios uh, just because we don't know what the patient may or may not do when presented with, uh, with an opportunity or, or potential to harm themselves or others. Uh, when we get into the EPS, this is a less than 24 hour care and evaluation space. Uh, you can see it's a, a fairly complex space. We have quite a few services that we have to provide to the patient. Uh, and then support space for the uh, nurses um, overseeing the mental health workers overseeing the patients. And this is really a large area. You can see by the diagram, the patient holding uh, is a space designed to, to care for the patient in a large setting with numerous patients in one space. Um, again, it's less than 24 hours. It's for somebody in crisis. Uh, you can see we have consultation rooms, quiet rooms, um, meal services, food will be provided. Uh, we'll provide uh, visitor opportunities. Um, and again, uh, there's a potential for needing to separate this patient population. If somebody comes in um, and needs to be isolated, we have uh, airborne isolation rooms and seclusion for somebody who needs to be calmed. Um, and you know, we don't know where these patients are coming from or who their traditional support 
um, services are, so telehealth and, and again, shower and bathing facilities, uh, just to give that patient the option and, and restore um, dignity. Uh, and then for the staff itself, uh, we have all the support services that would stack behind us. We call this area the command center. Um, the nurse can move freely off stage through these areas without having to come into uh, contact with the patients or or uh, visitors or the public. Um, and you would you can see by the the arrow that says adult holding to the left and minor holding to the right. We separate the holding spaces but are able to share the command centers all the administrative and support spaces. Uh, moving to a typical inpatient bed unit design. Um, you can see it's pretty complex with the amount of movement, with the amount of visibility, uh, with the adjacency adjacencies. Uh, it, it, there's a lot going on on these inpatient units. This, this diagram is, um, is not sized proportionally, um, but it's pretty close. A lot of activity area, patient rooms take up quite a bit of space. Uh, finding a way to interconnect the outdoor activity spaces is important and also maintaining visibility across the entire unit, um, also important. And you can see by the uh, uh, magenta dots at the bottom, we wanna provide a patient path into the unit and a visitor path or a uh, administrative path. Uh, that way we can stay on stage, off stage, and we don't have to have patients interacting with the, with the public. So for the patient and staff experience, it really does come down to having an enjoyable experience, but also making sure that everything is safe and comfortable. For um, the staff, it's really important to design um, a very intentional nurse station, um, whether that be open or closed, and we'll go more into that um, in, a fo in following slides but also making sure that there's really nice staff accommodations. That can be a nice respite room where staff, um, it typically is just a lounge, a nice lounge chair for one person to be in, have some quiet time in between shifts. And then also a nice garden. Staff also wanna enjoy the outdoors and also needs um, natural light, um, vent like nice natural air. Um, so making sure that the staff also has a space to be in when they're not on the unit because it is a really stressful job and the retention rate can be fairly high in these facilities. And then for patients, um, I touched on this briefly earlier, but making sure that there's a variety of program spaces and that's not just with um, whether it's noisy or quiet, but also a variety of feelings you'd get from, the space, from these spaces. So whether that be calm and cool, warm and cozy, light and bright, active and interactive, or calm and quiet. To the right, um, two pictures from Sharp Mesa Vista, you can see um, the top one is a quiet room and it has a nice blackboard where patients can write on it um, and then a nice wallpaper with a beach on it. It's just a nice, comfortable, calm um, environment to be in um, and a nice place to cool down. While on the bottom, you're gonna see an activity space that's more of interactive activities and it's a table with games, um, a whiteboard and a TV. And then for nourishment and dining, this space is very um, important because for some of the patients, it can be um, a place of high sensitivity if they do suffer from an eating disorder. And it is gonna be a social, a social space. So making sure that you're designing it as comfortable for everyone as possible in a place that really promotes um, talking with others and social ability. And of course, outdoor space is really important and making sure that the outdoor space is programmed um, intentionally. That can include a nice activity area, another example um, of a chalk, the chalk speeds unit um, from a different view, and then a nice garden. Therapy gardens have had um, a lot of research behind how they really do have positive effects on patients. And of course, space to wander around freely in the labyrinth, which you can see from the Lawson Health Research Institute, an example of that. Um, that's always a nice place and an interactive space to put in for patients. Next slide. And then uh, the on-stage, off-stage design um, is very important to implement in behavioral health. As you can see in the diagram in the right, there is three separate circulations, one for visitors, one for staff, and one for patients. For the patient circulation, there should be visibility for every, um, in every corner of it. 
So high visibility corridors and the patient is first gonna come in through a secure entry um, through the sally port and then go to the exam room intake and then be admitted directly into the unit. From there, um, there's the nourishment dining, patient laundry, a quiet room and seclusion room. For the public support, it can be a stressful time for visitors. So also creating a really nice experience for them um, with a nice waiting area and a visitor consultation room, which is typically right outside of the unit. Um, so patients don't have to travel far um, to see whoever is visiting. Um, for staff circulation, having a place for staff to retreat is very, very important. The command center should be able to be accessed through the nurse station and a back of house entry. So the staff should never have to enter the unit to go into these spaces. Um, the command center includes many typical um, functions such as the medication room, clean linen, soiled and clean utility, storage and administration spaces. And as you can see, there's a lot of secure points throughout the whole unit. Um, it's really important to make sure that everything is monitored and especially all the entry and exit points and around the nurse station is monitored. Next slide. So for nurse station. Well, one thing I'd like to add is I'm not sure if everyone here knows what a sally port is. And I know we've used it a couple of times. Uh, a sally port is a set of doors. I'll just sketch this out real quick. Where here's our entry door. Here's the next set of doors. This door won't open while this door is open. So it's a set of sequenced doors so that if this door opens, the patient can't rush through this space because they'll just hit the next set of doors. Just a point of clarification. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> um, and then for the nurse station, this is a heavily debated topic in behavioral health design. Um, and it really comes down to facility preference on whether they want an open versus closed design. Um, the pictures on the right, there's an example of an open nurse station and also a closed nurse station in the chalk speeds unit. The benefit of an open nurse station is it does create a more welcoming atmosphere and it does, never makes the patients feel ostracized. But the cons of it would be that it's a little more dangerous for staff. Um, there have been incidents of patients grabbing whatever is on the nurse station desk and throwing it at staff or throwing it at other patients. So it can be a little bit more dangerous. For closed nurse stations, the benefit is, is that you are gonna get that security for the staff and the other patients, but it's not always as welcoming and inviting as the nurse station is and doesn't always make patients feel the most trusted or safe. Um, the example to the bottom in the chalk speeds unit shows a more extreme closed nurse station design where it's a solid wall with just windows poking, but that's not always the design that you have to go with. There's always partial height glazing that kind of builds that bridge between open and closed nurse stations and still gives that feeling of openness to the patients, but also gives that feeling of security for the staff. And in any nurse station design, there should be direct access to the medication station and or, and or room. And the nurse station should have visibility for all areas, including the patient rooms, dining, activity areas, and the toilet room. And like I previously mentioned, everywhere should have a place to retreat for staff. Um, for closed nurse stations, it's a little easier because the nurse station itself is a place to retreat. But for open nurse stations, there can just typically be a door off of the nurse station that goes to the back of house command center that has the ability to lock and can be a pretty quick point of access for staff to go in if, they, if needed. The nurse station has to accommodate WOWs, emergency carts, workstations, hand washing fixtures, and a P-tube station as well. Next slide. For the patient rooms, it's um, a unique healthcare design because patients are not gonna be spending a large amount of time in these rooms as opposed to typical hospital rooms. Um, and although they're not gonna be spending a lot of time, it's very important to have high visibility into the room, but also still balance the privacy needs of patients. It's sometimes hard to find that balance um, when designing because you know that staff does need to monitor patients at all times, but also there are just, um, ways that you can implement this in terms of the door you choose and all that, um, that still allows patients to feel that sense of privacy that anyone would want and need. 
Um, and everything needs to be tamper resistant and anti ligature in this room, especially because patients will be spending a large amount of time unmonitored in this room. And although they're not going to be spending um, most of their day there, it still needs to have a variety of spaces like a small desk and seating. In the top right picture, you can see a desk um, directly below the window so the patients can have just a nice view outside while doing maybe writing in a journal. Um, and then also storage space and creating a comfortable and calming environment without overwhelming the patients. You don't want to be over designing these rooms because it can really lead to overwhelming the patients and leading them to feel very uncomfortable in the space. So in the pictures on the top, you can see that they just implemented a nice blackboard where patients can write on it and decorate their own room, which is great because it really gives them that ability to choose their own space to a certain extent and also views to nature. Um, there's a choice between um, patient rooms, whether that be shared or private. For adults, there's gonna be two patients per room max and for pediatric and adolescents, there's gonna be four patients. Um, although mostly private rooms are preferred um, for most patients, shared rooms also have their benefit for certain population groups, such as people suffering from substance use disorder. They really benefit from being in a shared room because they benefit from being around peers and having that accountability that way. So making sure that you still do have that balance between shared and private rooms in a facility. And 5% of these rooms must be accept, um, accessible. And for, um, there also must be airborne infection isolation rooms. And these are typically in a part of the unit that can be closed off from the rest of the unit. It still would have its own separate activity space, um, but be closed off. And with COVID, the new restriction is that it must have its own individual anti-room. So there can be no more shared anti-rooms if there's two airborne infection isolation rooms, each must have their own. Uh, I would say that post-COVID restriction, that's a, a user preference, not a code requirement. Uh, so moving into that therapy space that we talked about, calm, comforting, um, we're required to provide for 1228 uh, two, two types of areas within the unit. Uh, we have an active or less active, um, uh, we could call it um, quiet activity or recreational activity. And ideally they're spaced far enough apart where they don't spill into each other. Um, uh, again, those, those two separate areas, we want high quality lighting, um, views of nature. We wanna be able to see the passage of the day to maintain the circadian rhythm. Um, if they can be separated by an outdoor activity area, uh, that just gives more positive distraction. Um, and then if we talk about what is a quiet activity, that could be a library section, that could be a, a TV, um, somewhere to do puzzles, games. Um, and then the more active area would be uh, table games, um, uh, probably not ones that would irritate the, the patients. I think ping pong would be out, but um, uh, uh, yeah, more, more recreational uh, activity. Uh, let's see, for, for the group rooms, um, they are a code requirement that we provide uh, group rooms in the space for group therapy. And again, within those rooms, we want to have uh, built-in privacy, uh, screening devices, um, high quality lighting. Uh, we can use technology via TVs, monitors. That way we can provide telehealth in those group rooms. Uh, and then we can think of the group rooms as a multi-use space. Uh, the, the group rooms have to be fairly large. Um, 225 square feet minimum clear floor. So we could do arts and crafts in there and think of it as a way to, to do um, additional therapy outside of the more active, um, quiet activity and recreational activity. And again, they're, they're inter, interactive spaces um, for the, for the well-being of the patient at all times. Um, getting into some pediatric specific designs, um, what we see on the right is a, it's called a snozolian, snozolian, snozolian room. Um, and I added a video here. Uh, what, it, what it is is a very um, uh, multi-sensory room with things moving on the walls. We have the bubbles coming up. It's a, it's a place for the, for the child to escape. Um, 
It's good for treating all sorts of uh, behavioral health and mental health conditions. Um, uh, there's also something called a sensory integration room. Um, and these can be from the, the bubbling wall and light to actual play structures, um, which, uh, which can get pretty exciting when they're inside a room. And then seclusion rooms, uh, not used as often for, for pediatric patients. Uh, they really take advantage of these multi-sensory rooms more than anything. Moving down to technology integration. Uh, again, we use, we use video conferencing uh, for telehealth, uh, and we can put those in the group rooms or we can have telehealth rooms. Um, paging systems are, are fairly important in these facilities, uh, one for, for, for staff and patients. Uh, but what we don't want is paging systems like in a, in a typical hospital going off all the time uh, because those can be scary for the patients, they can, they can be trigger points. So we really have to be considerate on how the paging system works. Um, that has to be fairly discreet. Uh, occupancy sensors for lighting. Um, there's been a new push for infrared screening at checkpoints to check for temperature uh, in response to COVID. Um, one of the more interesting items that we found is the remote override for water and light controls. Um, I have a diagram here of a system um, that was recommended. It's the master troll. And what this is, is to prevent the patient from flushing unwanted objects down the toilet. Uh, if they attempt to flush, the system will tell the nurse station um, that they're attempting to flush. If they are known to flush objects down the toilet, uh, they'll get a warning at the nurse station and they can go check the toilet for whatever object may or may not be in there and then allow the flush later. Um, and then the duress systems, there's, there's a few different options. We have the patient assist, we have nurse call, staff assist, and then the panic call. Um, we really do want to drill down which ones are used in which spaces and it, it really comes down to the staff and, and what they prefer, but being very considerate about what's being paged over the, the speakers. And then cameras, because this is a, a sensitive area, um, but also a uh, area of concern, uh, we do want to have cameras where they are required and we do want them to be discreet as possible. And then security in general, door hardware. Door hardware is a big ligature point, so we have to be considerate of the type of door hardware, making sure it's anti-ligature. Uh, we want to make sure the doors swing out when they're required and swing in when they're um, are not required or swing in when they, when they can. Typically in these facilities, we wanna swing the doors out as often as possible so that they can't be barricaded. Um, and then when we get into the security checkpoint of how people come into the building, um, we have this diagram to the right, uh, building entry secure checkpoint. Um, they'll come through a secure entry vestibule. Uh, we wanna be able to to allow people to drop off uh, items that may be considered dangerous to the staff and to the patients. So we'll provide secure storage via lockers or um, behind the desk of a security checkpoint or a, a staffed desk. And then if there is additional concern, we will have x-ray for larger items, bags, purses, backpacks. And then for the patient itself, uh, metal detectors. Uh, typically a metal detector will be at the patient intake from the 5150 or the emergency ambulance drop-off, but it doesn't hurt to have it at the front of the building uh, to prevent dangerous objects from entering. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly critical spot in the building design and needs to be considered uh, extensively because this can be very overwhelming for somebody in crisis to come through a secure checkpoint. So designing with intent, designing uh, a, a calming approach to this uh, is important. This, this diagram doesn't do the entry point um, justice. And then if we ask, well, what is this? What does this facility look like? Um, here's a, a, an option. Uh, this, is, this is the facility that we've been working on for the past year. Uh, you can see it's a three-story building, um, lots of greenery around it. Um, consider it large windows, uh, lots of views, lots of green space, um, outdoor terraces, um, a 
very dynamic building uh, with, with lots to offer. Uh, Sammy, I don't know if you have anything you want to add at the end. And then uh, some, some really good reference uh, for those uh, designing these facilities. The, the VA has um, uh, a great set of documents. Um, Center for Health Design has a lot of uh, really good sources of information, uh, the FGI guidelines. Um, of course, you're going to refer to the CBC, Title 22, Chapter 9, and then the New York State Patient Safety Standards Guidelines, uh, a great resource for items that will go into the facility, uh, a really good starting point. And of course, uh, OSHPOD. And, and as we design these facilities, because they are fairly new and because they reference multiple parts of the code, um, we, we have the opportunity to give them feedback now and say, you know, we think this is working. Uh, we think some of this stuff isn't working. So uh, always using them as a, as a resource or uh, to better inform them of how we can do our jobs better is, is important. And that is the presentation. Thank you uh, all for joining. If there's uh, any questions, you can post it to the chat or go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and um, I'll, uh, there we go. I'll go back to the interesting slide. And if there's no question, we can, uh, we can all go to happy hour early. Oh, no, there's one in the chat. I think there's two. There are three. There yeah. you go. <laughs> um, I would say here's your example of a EPS. Uh, we don't have any emergency psychiatric facility locally that we've done. Uh, I can tell you that there are some in the works, but they are not our projects. Um, is this project going through Oshpod and going to bid? Uh, that would be a contractor question. I don't, I don't know if I can answer that one. It is going through Oshpod. I'm sure it will be bid at some point. And then what hospital slide is this? This is a rendering. Um, I assume you're talking about the last one. Uh, it's a facility that we've been working on for the past year, but uh, it is undisclosed at this point. And uh, yes, as Brad has noted, uh, a lot of these decisions are based on the patient population. I have a question for you, Scott. This is Marcus. Yeah. Are you seeing a lot more uh, EPS services being implemented in the uh, behavioral health industry? Um, I'm not really aware of that many going on right now. Yeah, anecdotally, there are a lot of these types of facilities coming. Um, the idea is to take the pressure off the emergency departments. Right. So yes, there, there will be more of these, these types of facilities, maybe not this comprehensive with all the inpatient um, services, but yeah, mental, mental health urgent care is coming. Um, yeah, there's, there's more of that on the way. Right, because I haven't seen that locally. I know I've done a lot of emergency departments and uh, mm -hmm. we, you know, we've always had a component for uh, behavioral health mm -hmm. as, you know, as a part of that. But uh, yeah, we're, we're, seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot more um, behavioral health projects come online, especially OSHPOD 5 as well. Mm -hmm. But are you, I have another question. Are you also seeing a lot of PHF units coming out? Um, uh, psychiatric outpatient? Yes, yeah, yeah, that, that, is, that is one of the other, other projects that we see a lot of different, different acronyms, similar, mm -hmm. similar service, yeah. Right, right. And, and this one's, the, the EPS is basically attached to an, uh, a hospital, and you're saying there's the urgent care aspect of it too, which is a standalone? Correct. The occupancy, okay. Correct, correct. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I know there is, there's, there's still some litigation, not litigation, uh, state level discussion about how to, how to make an emergency psychiatric function 
as an ED so that we're not sending these patients to the ED unnecessarily. But as I understand, that's still, still being worked out. Um, you know, along, along those same lines, Scott, um, have you run into any, um, any challenges, I guess, with OSHPOD? Um, I know we are currently working on a, a behavioral health, and I know this is the first, you know, code cycle that OSHPOD has dealt with for OSHPOD 5, and there's a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. on everyone's part, <laughs> including OSHPOD. Have you run up against that on some of these projects? Yeah, we, we have. It's, it's, it seems to be uh, you know, there's, there's more clarity than there ever was before, um, but there's still a bit of a negotiation. Right. It seems that they're, they're, they're um, still not understanding some of the levels of care mm -hmm. that they go into some of these institutes. Um, that's what we're finding out. <laughs> the code seems to be still written for more of a, uh, uh, more of an inpatient type. I, I kind of a lo lower, you know, level of care. Mm-hmm. Agreed. I mean, we, we do have the opportunity to, to tell Oshpod this and, and yeah, we are keeping copious notes to have the discussions and we'll be, we'll be helping the, the process along as we better define this. Great. Well, uh, thank you for, for everybody's time. Um, feel free to reach out with any other questions. Um, make sure to send MJ your, your information to get your, your HSW credits and have a, have a great day.